Hey everybody, we are remote today from Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. I know you guys can't believe it, but yes, we did come here to see if, if he really was true. And as you'll see in the picture here soon, we found him sleeping over there. So welcome. Um, what do you have to add to it? Hey, Shane, front seat, please. Jeremy, come over here. Please take a chair. And Jerry, hey, definitely Jerry, make sure the coffee is made. Glenn, no horse around back there. We need your both attentions, okay, guys? And again, let's thank our sound crew. Adam, thank you very much. You guys are awesome. Anyway, with now, first announcement is? Well, what we would do is came here to find something out, and Ivers wanted to go up here and find out if you could find my shadow. We look for Dan's shadow. Can't see the shadow, so we we don't know what's we don't know happen. what's going next. So. But for announcements, remember uh, coming in October is a sign up for work around the church. We really need help with that, so make sure on the back you sign up. That would be great. Yeah, and that is October fifteenth and sixteenth. It's a Friday and Saturday, and the second one is starting this Thursday. Is the single parents financial peace university class starting up? That'll be at six o'clock to eight o'clock. So, thank you. And now we'll turn this over to Jeff. Thank you, Jeff, for uh, bearing through this. I'm going to look for Dan's shadow. See ya. What came to my mind was uh, the movie Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> um, we may have to edit that out so they don't hear me say that. But anyway, uh, we had to edit that video out, too, because it was a little long. So we had to crop some things out and uh, take out the inappropriate things and all that kind of stuff. But no, it's good to have those guys. They're having a fun time. They're making a tour as they did last summer to some Frank Lloyd Wright houses. And I think they went to see Falling Waters in Pennsylvania. That's why they're in Punxsutawney or whatever, whatever you call it, checking out the, uh, the uh, groundhog there. So uh, with that said, though, um, let's move into our worship time. And uh, we'll do that with a word of prayer this morning. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for these final days of summer. We thank you for vacations that many of us had been able to enjoy this last summer. Uh, we thank you for trips like Dan and Ivers are on right now and opportunities just to have a good time and uh, finish out these last weeks of summer. We pray for blessing and favor upon them as they have um, the last drive home uh, later on today or tomorrow. But God, help us now to turn our focus, our attention on you as we worship you with songs that remind us of you, that encourage us of who you are and remind us of whose we are. And so, God, we thank you for the opportunity to sing. And so, God, direct our hearts to you this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. I thought that was thunder that was going on, but it was just the wind in their microphones. And uh, so, lovely day, lovely morning. It's good to be here today. Uh, we've been doing a lot of new songs lately, and uh, I know that kind of put, gets you ban back on your heels a little bit. So we're going to do some familiar songs today. So things, that, songs that you don't have to think about too much, but they're great songs, they're great reminders of, of who God is and how he moves among us, what he wants to accomplish with us. Let's all stand and sing.
The mountains will move every chain of the past. You've broken into all our fear, all our lies. We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible. Every giant will fall. The mountains will move every chain of the past. You've broken into all our fear, all their lies. We're singing the truth that nothing I was blind, now I'm singing in color. I had dead, but now I'm living forever. I have failed, but you were my redeemer. changed from a ruin to treasure I am given a hope and a future blessing surely every season you are good to me oh, oh, oh you are good to me oh, oh, oh you are good to me oh you were there in the valley of shadows you were there in the depths of my sorrow my strength, my hope for tomorrow. I've been blessed beyond all measure. I am counting every blessing, counting every blessing, letting go and trusting when I cannot see. I am counting every blessing, counting every blessing. Surely every season you are good to me. Whoa, 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 you are good to me. Whoa, 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 you are good to me. Surely your goodness will soothe me. Surely your heart is still for me. I will remember your mercies all my days through every storm and gale. I am counting every blessing, counting every blessing, letting go and trusting when I cannot see. I am counting every blessing, counting every blessing. Surely every season you are good to me. I am counting every blessing, counting every blessing. Letting go and trusting when I cannot see. I am counting every blessing, counting every blessing. Surely every season you are good to me. Oh, 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 you are good to me. Oh, 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 you are good to me. For your goodness, I will ever praise you. Oh, 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 you are good.
Let's take some time this morning and pray for one another. Um, We'd love to hear from you as well and uh, hear what's happening in your lives. If we can pray for you specifically, I want to just share one that uh, was the name of Jesus. Amen. Promises are so many, it's hard to remember all of them. But it's nice to remember that they're real. That when God makes a promise, He keeps it. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sing. Faithful you are. Faithful forever you will be. and amen all your promises are yes and amen oh beautiful savior you have brought me near you pulled me from the ashes have broken every curse blessed redeemer you have set this captive free lord i can't help but sing are yes and amen faithful you are faithful forever you will be faithful you are now your promises are yes and amen Says, ah, yes, and amen. So, rest in his promises today. We'll rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness, faithful you are, faithful forever you will be, faithful you are, yes you are Lord, all your promises. Says, oh, yes, and amen. Oh, 
Oh, my Father is faithful. Yes and amen. Yes, my Father is faithful. Yes and amen. Oh, my Father, he's so faithful. Yes and amen. Mm, my Father is faithful. Yes and amen. Oh, my Father is faithful. Sing, my Father is faithful. Yes, no, oh, my Father is so faithful. Yes, oh, sing, my Father is faithful. Yes, amen. Oh, faithful. Says our yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. Good singing. That was awesome. Thanks. You may be seated. Good stuff. Thank you for those songs of encouragement to us this morning. Uh, just a quick update. Um, since many of you were part of the process of helping work through uh, my project for my dissertation um, at Indiana Wesleyan, and uh, I just submitted uh, the final revisions of chapters four and five, and the entire project is being submitted to the committee this week. So um, I've gone through four, thank you, I've gone through several edits in the process, but that's done now, and my advisor said, you're done. Let's send it off to the committee. So they will then decide, hey, this is good, or they'll say, this really sucks. You know, start over. I don't know what they'll say. But anyway, just prayers for that. Thank you for those of you especially who participated in that process, filling out some questionnaires and all that kind of stuff afterwards. Um, getting closer, my friend uh, Mark Wilson is the only one that's gotten through the whole thing yet. Uh, of us 15 left in the program, he, uh, he graduated uh, last a couple weeks ago made his way through it all. Um, he is already a writer. He's written a few books, and so I think writing for him is, is easy. Uh, for the rest of us, man, this has been a struggle, and so I'm hoping maybe to be, you know, second or third in line after him, but uh, he was a great, um, turned into a really helpful and great friend in the process, and uh, excited that he was able to finish his project uh, in a very timely uh, way. All right, with that said, let's move into today's message that God has laid out in my heart. I want to pray, and then we'll do just that. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Again, a chance to sing and to pray, and now hear your word proclaimed. I pray that you would uh, help me to get out of the way so that we can just hear what you have to say through me this morning, God. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, um, this coming week uh, marks the return of an event that hasn't been here in Grand Rapids for a couple years now, and that event is Art Prize. Um, I think it's been a two-year hi hiatus since it was here, and obviously COVID last year. I think the plans were to be there last year, but it wasn't. Uh, so this uh, Saturday, the 18th, marks the 18-day event known as Art Prize. How many of you are big fans of Art Prize? Okay, my wife and I and some combination of kids will go down and, you know, spend a day or an evening uh, visiting some of the different arts uh, that is on display at the various places throughout town. So we've done this for the last several years doing just that. And as we do so, I'm surprised by a couple things. Number one, I'm surprised by what is art, right? Like some of the things that are art always catch you by surprise. Like, okay, if my five-year-old granddaughter could do that, you know, and it's not a kindergarten exhibit, right? Um, I'm not sure that's... Our, anyway, um, no, not to offend any of you who are, you know, kindergarten level artists. But nevertheless, you always question some things that are depicted as art. And then along with that are the weird things that you see. We went to an exhibit at Meyer Garden probably three years back. And they had some of the weirdest things I've ever seen that were on display um, as part of the Art Prize um, exhibit. And one of them was this guy that would make these flowers, and he made these flowers out of his human skin and his fingernails. 
He had collected them. Yeah. Yes. Weird, right? Like, okay, I guess you can call that art. But uh, Rob's like, no, that's not art. So that, that was a weird exhibit. You guys didn't get over to Meyer Garden that year, but it was a weird exhibit. So we walked out of there, like, scratching our heads, like, what is that? Anyway, um, tried to forget that, but I haven't forgotten it. So anyway, um, but let's move on to the other thing I notice about art in Art Prize. And, and that is, has to do with the amazing time and effort that goes into the art that's there. There was this one piece a few years back. You might remember this picture of Abraham Lincoln, I think is on the next slide here. This is down at the Amway Grand Plaza Hotel. How many of you saw that? That's a lot bigger than it looks there in the picture, right? And that's 24,000 pennies this guy used to make that. What an amazing work of art that was. And then a couple years ago, I think the last time we were down there was this next one that looks like a photograph and I think that's the artist standing there. It looks like a photograph, but it's actually did that in pencil, right? I mean, what an amazing work of art that is. And then there was one more. I think this was in the um, DeVos place. Um, I don't know if you remember that one or not, but I think this won one of the awards that year too. But this, is, this doesn't do it justice. This is a like huge painting. Um, and just the amazing time and effort that goes into that. And so you see all these works of art in the time and uh, the detail and all of that is just absolutely amazing. And that highlights for us this morning something that we all need from time to time. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. This one thing that we need uh, from time to time in our Christian walk, our Christian journey. So in the last few weeks, we have been walking through these works of fiction, right? Um, faith and fiction, combining the great books that we have and uh, looking at the message and the virtue that kind of goes along with it. So a few weeks ago, we started out with Cormac McCarthy's The Road. Uh, then we went on to Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Then we last week looked at the Jane Austen classic called Persuasion. So we looked at these three works of fiction. Some of you might question how they're deemed classics and why so many have read them, but they are. Um, I will say, too, that I am indebted to this book by um, Karen uh, Swallow Pryor. She wrote a book about four years ago called On Reading Well. And in here, she identifies some of these works of fiction and attributes a virtue to go along with them. So she's offered some great insights for me uh, in the process of reading some of these books these last few weeks. Um, and so when we looked at The Road, we looked at the virtue of hope. Okay, that was the first week. Then two weeks ago, we looked at uh, the F. Scott Fitzgerald classic, The Great Gatsby, and we looked at the uh, virtue of excess, right? And we saw that uh, that is, uh, uh, we looked at the, not the virtue of excess, but we looked at how excess plays in that. And the virtue was what? Temperance. Like, let's, let's say no to some things, right? In a world where we live in excess, we need to learn how to say no. And so we looked at that a couple weeks back. And then last week, we looked at the Jane Austen book, Persuasion. We didn't focus on persuasion. We focused on patience, suffering patience. In the midst of things we're waiting for to have happen, we have to suffer. That's what the, uh, the main character in the story, Anne Elliot, has to endure. Great suffering patience, right, while she waits for her man to come back into her life. And likewise, we have to go through that, to understanding that what is will not always be, right? And so we learned that these last few weeks. So... That was the series so far, and I'm going to wrap up today with one final book and one final virtue. And the virtue, the one that those artists make use of to complete those amazing works of art, is the uh, virtue called diligence. Diligence. So we'll talk a little bit about that here this morning. Now, the book, The Pilgrim's Progress, is a book which teaches us the value of diligence. Now, uh, show of hands, how many of you have read this book before, ever? Okay. Um, how many of you have seen a movie based on the book? Okay. So most of you are familiar with the book to some level. You've, how many of you have at least heard of it if you've never, never read it? Um, this book was written back in 1678. It's the oldest book that we are looking at in the series, of course, um, Jane Austen's book was written in the 1800s. This one is 1678. Next to the King James Bible, it's the most read, most, um, most read, most purchased book in all of history, is in the English language. 
uh, which I didn't know. That was incredible. And, and since it was published in 1678, it's never been out of print, which is amazing in and of itself. So this book has been turned into movies. It's been adapted in various ways. It's had children's stories written for kids out of it. Um, there's ones with lots of illustrations. They've even taken the old English out, and someone has published a modern reader's version of the book. So most of us who don't read in old English can understand what we're reading. Um, so that's cool. So this book has been published over and over and over. Now, what you may not know about the author is that John Bunyan was this guy born in 1628, I believe it was. And he's born, he serves in the English Civil War. And after the English Civil War, he becomes a pastor. Only he becomes a pastor in the wrong persuasion. What I mean by that is the Church of England was the official church. And he was not licensed in the Church of England to preach. And yet, he's this Baptist pastor who's preaching. And sure enough, because of that, he gets thrown in jail. He's a nonconformist. He's not abiding by the Church of England. He gets thrown in jail. He's there for 12 years. And during his 12 years in jail, he writes his spiritual autobiography, which some people have read, a very popular book. But it's while in prison that he starts his work on this book, his most famous book. And then later on, he spends eight more months in prison. And he finishes the book eventually, and that's the book that we have in front of us today. Now, just as a quick side note, there are two parts to the book. The first part is the one I'm talking about this morning. The second part is um, featuring his wife and kids, okay? So, uh, moving on to uh, the story and its plot and its premise this morning. Why is this book so interesting? Why is it so compelling why have I chosen it? Um, the story, again, depicts this character. His name is Christian. And it's an allegory. The whole story is an allegory, which means it means something that's real on this life. And so the main character is a Christian who is going to be a Christian. And this gentleman is um, feeling the weight of sin. And during that season of feeling the weight of sin, he's visited by a person who's called the evangelist. And that evangelist represents a evangelist, right, sharing the gospel. And he says to this man, Christian, you need to leave this city, the city of destruction. That's where everyone lives. And you need to make your way to a different city, a better city. And that's called the celestial city. You need to make your way there. And so Bunyan tries to convince his wife and kids to go along with him. They don't want to go. They want to stay back. And so he goes off on this journey by himself. And again, part two is the Disney ending where they follow him to the celestial city, okay? Um, but nevertheless, as he makes his way to the celestial city, there are all sorts of obstacles, all sorts of road bumps along the way that he encounters. He encounters a person by the name of worldly wisdom, which represents the person who is trying to convince him that, you know what, you don't need to, to be a follower of God. You don't need religion to have a happy, successful life. You don't need any of that. And so worldly wisdom tries to convince Christian to go back to the city of destruction. So all along the way, he faces these obstacles. And the main obstacle, the one that he faces more than anything else, is this obstacle called Apollyon, and that represents sin. So he faces Apollyon all the time. Uh, and we'll talk more about that here in just a minute. So he's along this journey, facing many things. Eventually, he makes it to the celestial city, of course, but... Along the way, he faces lots and lots of problems to get there. The way he gets to the celestial city is marked by this virtue that we're talking about today, and that is the virtue of diligence. So what exactly is diligence? I think most of us might have an idea, but here's uh, a little bit of a definition to kind of help us along here this morning. It comes from a Latin word, apparently, uh, that means to single out to value highly, to esteem, to love, to prize. And so that was like the original definition of diligence, right? And then it kind of morphed into add these things too below that, to show carefulness, to practice attentiveness. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because you show carefulness, you practice attentiveness to the kinds of things that you love and esteem and value, right? So that makes sense. And then we've kind of added this, and this is probably what diligence is more known for today, and that is this idea of steady persistent effort. And I think that's what we see in those great works of art, isn't it? Steady, persistent effort. The hours it would have taken to produce that Abraham Lincoln portrait astounds me, right? I mean, that's amazing. Steady, persistent effort. Now, um, Karen Pryor will say in her book 
that while diligence is a virtue, it's not always virtuous. In other words, I can be diligent um, as a thief, as someone who is uh, breaking into homes, stealing cars. I can be really good at that, right? Steady, persistent effort in doing that. That's not virtuous, right? That's not a virtue. Diligence practiced in a virtuous way is something that seeks after things that are noble and good, right? Would you agree? So that's what we're talking about, noble, good sort of deeds. Now, the Bible is clear on diligence. We could look at several parts of God's word this morning. We're going to look at just three simple passages that come from the Old Testament book of Proverbs. Here's what the writer of Proverbs said in Proverbs 10. He said, lazy people are soon poor, hard, diligent workers get rich. Okay? Proverbs 12, 27. Lazy people don't even cook the game they catch, but the diligent make use of everything they find. And then one more, Proverbs 21. Good planning and hard, diligent work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. So you can see how the Bible speaks into the value of diligence, right? The writer of Proverbs is saying it's really wise to practice diligence because it's going to help with life in general, right? Now, the other side of diligence is something else, though, right? What's the other side of diligence, would you say? He kind of hints at it here um, in these verses, the hasty person or the lazy person is really the other side, right? And in the, uh, the tradition of Christianity, we call that slothfulness, right? Being lazy is to be slothful. And so if um, showing diligence is showing care and attention to something, then being slothful is to really not care, right? To not care, to really not attend to those kind of things that are very important to attend to. And so we are said to be slothful, right? Now, I'm going out on a limb here this morning, and I don't want to offend any one of you today by calling you a name, but there are some of us who are less than diligent in our Christian walk right now, okay? There are some of us who walk through the door, we're here today, thanks be to God for that, but aside from Sunday morning, our spiritual life might not be all that strong. Right? We are slothful. Now, here's what Augustine, or I'm sorry, Thomas Aquinas once said about sloth. He says, sloth is a mortal sin robbing us of our appetite for God, our zest for God, our interest and enjoyment of God. Sloth stops us from seeking God, and that means we do not find him. There are seasons in our lives where we enter into a spirit of slothfulness, I think. And I say this from my own experience. Like, I've been there. I've been there as a parishioner. I've been there as a pastor. It's all I can do to get up here and preach because the rest of my spiritual life is a wreck. Not today, but it has been, right? If you don't take care of yourself, if you find yourself doing what Christian's going to do, we'll talk about in just a moment, we find ourselves in a place where we become slothful, where we walk away from God, where we don't have much time in our schedule to think about higher things, right? So we enter this place of slothfulness. You might call it a spiritual slump. I think that's a good way to put it as well. We all enter into that season where we are in a spiritual slump, and some of you are probably there right now, and that's perfectly okay. The bigger question this morning that we want to try to answer is how do we get out of that, right? How do we move beyond that spirit of sloth or um, not caring, that spiritual slump, and move into something else. Now, as we move through the story of Christian, as mentioned earlier, uh, he has that obstacle uh, that he faces, and the biggest one is the obstacle called Apollyon, which is sin. And sin rears its ugly head against Christian on several occasions, and it eventually uh, says things to Christian like, you're not good enough. You're not devoted to Christ enough. You're not good enough to make it to the celestial city. You're full of sin. And I think we've all experienced that to some level, to some degree. And I think which leads to our spiritual slump more than anything else is our sin. And it's not our sin in it 
direct sort of way, it's the after effects of our sin. Like the guilt, right? The guilt that overwhelms us when we mess up. And that's what we see happening in Christian. The guilt overwhelms him. But then, in a great spirit of diligence, after hearing these voices in his head saying to him, you're not good enough, you can't be a follower of Christ, you're not devoted enough, this is what Christian says. I like these words. I want to share these with you next. He said these words to Apollyon. He said, all this is true and much more that thou hast left out. But, but, the prince whom I serve and honor is merciful and ready to forgive. Christian offers that diligent response, gets back up, presses on, and makes his way eventually to the celestial city. That's where the story ends. I think also about our journey, right? Because this whole story is one that fascinates me and has fascinated so many people for years and years because it represents, as an allegory, our Christian walk. It's not a pilgrim's progress, or it's not pilgrim's progress, it's a pilgrim's progress. It's your pilgrim's progress, it's my progress as a Christ follower, it's my walk, it's your walk. John Bunyan wanted to convey to you and to me what the Christian journey looks like. And as we have said before, the Christian journey might be simple. <laughs> might look simple, but it's never easy. It's never easy. Our lives are filled with ups and downs along the way. You know that, I know that. There's in-between parts, which are great too. But our life is not easy. We cannot promise an easy life. And John Bunyan was paramount in showing that very thing in this book. Like you can't say the Christian walk is an easy walk. No, it is filled with all sorts of things that try to turn us back, try to move us in a different direction. And yet, in the midst of that, in the midst of our sin, which again is, I think, the primary thing that leads us to a place of complacency and spiritual slump, uh, a spiritual slump that so oftentimes can be a pattern in our life, the one way we get out is to say words like, Christian offered back to Apollyon. Words like we find in the book of Romans, for example. In Romans 4, I'm sorry, Romans 3.23, here's what the writer says. I want to read this and I cannot read my Bible. I can do everything else, but I can't read my Bible without my glasses. So let me open my Bible up now that I can see what I'm about to share with you. Um, but here's what Paul says in Romans 3.23. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. That's true, right? But God freely and graciously declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from our penalty for our sins. And yes, we sin, but I would rather refer to ourselves as saints who occasionally sin, not as sinners, right? We are saints who occasionally, every day, mess up right? That's what he says here, right? You are sinners. Yes, but, but God has declared you what? Righteous. He's declared me righteous. He's declared you righteous. And because of that, in Christ, we are a new creation. And because of that, we can whisper back to that voice. And that voice so oftentimes in my head is certainly Satan, the devil who is whispering lies to me. But we whisper back words like Romans 3.23 or Romans 6.23, which says, the wages of sin is death. We know that. The wages of sin is death every time. But the free gift of God is salvation through Christ our Lord. We have been declared righteous. We've been declared forgiven. We've been declared saved in Christ. Those are the kind of words that we can return to when we're feeling defeated, when we're down on our knees, when that voice is cried out to us over and over again. In those moments, we recite verses like this that remind us who we are and whose we are, right? We can do that very sort of thing, just like Christian once did. And we too can find ourselves heading in the right direction once more. Now, there's a whole lot of things that I have given up on over the years. 
um, I have given up on my dreams and aspirations of being a professional baseball player. We were just talking about baseball this morning with John and Jody. And, uh, you know, as a kid playing baseball, I wanted to play for the Detroit Tigers. I mean, that was my dream. I was pretty good. Um, but at some point, I gave it up, right? I've given up my dreams of being on the PGA Tour. I was an avid golfer in my teenage years and loved the game of golf and wanted to be on the PGA Tour. I think there's still hope for me because there is a thing called the Senior Tour. So that could, that could possibly happen. The problem is I don't play anywhere near enough golf to do that. But nevertheless, uh, I had to give up on that sort of dream at some point as well. And I've had to give up on my dream of being anything other than a non-playing musician, okay? I've taken two semesters of guitar, and I've taken one semester of piano. And uh, at some point along the way, I just stopped, right? I stopped practicing. I wasn't diligent. I lacked the virtue that so many of us need. So I have to let, I have to let John and, and uh, Rob lead us in worship instead, which is far better for all of us, I'm sure. But... Um, <laughs> Nevertheless, those are dreams we all have, right? Things like that. And you have dreams too, like dreams that you've maybe given up on as well over the years. But the one dream I've not given up on, the one thing I've not given up on is this Christian hope that I have. Has the Christian journey been easy? Absolutely not. It's never easy. There's been trials, there's been tribulations, there's been all sorts of things that have caused me to go off the path, come back on the path a thousand times, right? You've had the same sort of experience, I'm sure. There's been seasons where I have been on fire for God. There has been seasons where I've been complacent and spiritual slothfulness has entered into my heart. We've all been there. The way out is this virtue called diligence. Um, we think of diligence and perseverance kind of the same sort of way, but they're a little bit different, right? To persevere to the end requires diligence. So if, if diligence, uh, if perseverance is like staying afloat in the water, then diligence is what's happening below the water. Your feet are treading water, right? That's how you stay afloat. That's how we stay afloat. Yesterday, I had to go out and run eight miles, and... Um, I was very grudgingly doing that and didn't want to do that at all. And I went out there, and I knew it was going to take one step at a time, one mile at a time. That's how I got through it. So an hour and 40 minutes later, I persevered to the end and finished that eight-mile trek. Our Christian life requires us to persevere. And the way we persevere, the way we persevere is through steps every single day of faith. Steps that require effort. And I think if we can do this on a regular basis, we too can share the kind of words that Timothy once, that Paul once shared with Timothy in his letter to Timothy, the second one. Here's what Paul says at the end of his life. Here's what he says. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which is the Lord, the righteous judge, who will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. So I think what Paul is saying is he's kept the fight. And let me encourage all of you, regardless of where you're at, if you're in a place of great religious rejoicing, that's awesome. We celebrate that with you. But if you're in a place of spiritual complacency, you're in a spiritual slump, let me encourage you to keep on fighting. That's what Paul does. That's what Christian does. We keep up the fight every single day, one step at a time. And in the end, if we can do that, we too can share these words like Paul once shared the prize is not just for me, Paul says, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. May that serve as our motive to keep on going. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your reminder of Christian virtues like diligence and the need to practice diligence more and more in seasons of great joy.
joy and in seasons of doubt, we are required, we are called to be diligent. Help us to follow you with diligence. Help us to hear your word proclaimed. May these thoughts and this vision of the future that Paul was longing for serve as that reminder and that motive for you and I, for all of us, to keep on going. I pray this in Jesus' name today. Amen. Our benediction comes from John's gospel. Here's what Jesus says there. He says, I am leaving you with a gift. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Receive that peace today. God bless you all. Thanks for being here. We'll see you again next week. When I'm searching for answers, I'm finding.